but inside the body, it is an issue. Uh, betas, they require a little bit more shielding. Uh, they can be stopped by a, a thin piece of metal or a piece of plexiglass. Whereas gammas, that has exponential attenuation. So usually you're gonna use something with a lot more uh, density and a higher Z. Like uh, you can use a lot of concrete or you can use some lead layers or something like that. Now, radiation is literally ubiquitous. In fact, the actual source of energy from geothermal is radioactive decay in the core of the earth. All of the primordials, the uraniums and the thoriums and the potassiums, those were here at the formation of the earth and they're still here and their decay inside the earth keeps it molten. That's where the heat comes from. But the point that they're primordial means that they were here at the formation of the earth. And they'll be here even after the sun goes red giant, they'll still be here. And so they're everywhere. And they get concentrated in different places, just like other ores do, like you know, iron ore or nickel ore or something like that. But because of the potassium, it also gets concentrated in food, as long with other things like radium or other radionuclides can get concentrated in foods and they're also used throughout industry. And there's some pictures here of different places where you get them. Now they're not all equal. They're gonna give very different doses. And what we'll find out here shortly is that radon in terms of these and medical are the big ones. So you can see here that from the background, all of this stuff that's green over here, this is natural. This is what you get just because you're alive, right? Because you're not shielding yourself from the earth and because you're not wearing a filtered mask and you're breathing in radon and because you're not deep underground, you're not shielded from cosmic rays, right? All of this over here is what you'd get just because you decide you wanna live in the biosphere. So that's what's natural. What we get over here is the benefit from medical, basically a doctor's ability to see if your bone is broken so they know how to set it so that they can do fluoroscopy so that they can do some kind of an intravenous uh, uh, procedure without having to cut you open. You can do basically outpatient surgery instead of having to you know, do a two, pay, two, two week stay because you got your torso cut open or something like that. And so on average, this is about 625 millirem per year when you take in the background and the medical. Now, typically medical uh, x-rays, you get more of those as you get older, um, uh, but it will all depend. But this is just the US average. So that kind of scales with what is ambient in terms of your day-to-day -day exposure from both background and medical. Something that we'll, I'll point out here is that for industrial, that's like nuclear power uh, or other kinds of things that have to do with nuclear technology. And this is all gonna be less than one-tenth of a percent. Uh, a lot of it's gonna be even a smaller sliver of that. So you have to basically lump all of them together just to get that 10th of a percent. You can see it's even less than that. So what we do in health physics is largely ALARA. And that means we're just controlling radiation. Uh, and, and, and the ALARA program is really like a QA program. If you were making widgets, let's say you're making phones or you were making coffee cups or whatever you're making, as an engineer, you're going to want to optimize the process. You're going to want to minimize waste. You're going to want to minimize energy. You want to increase throughput. You want to increase quality. And all of these things require tracking and trending, which is really what ALARA does to make sure that we're in control of all of the radiation and the radioactivity and so forth. And so just like when you're doing uh, heat theory, heat trans uh, uh, combustion theory, there's a limit to how much you can get uh, when it comes to uh, uh, thermodynamics, you have the Carnot efficiency, but as an engineer, you're gonna wanna get as close to that as possible. But by the time you're right near 40%, it doesn't make sense to spend another million dollars to get a 10th of a percent, right? It's a, it's a balance of how much it costs to get to the highest efficiency. And so that's a risk management issue that we have both in, uh, in, in, in the nuclear industry and in every industry, you wanna do risk management. So with the LARA, largely the, the biggest focus is on shielding, um, postings, basically letting people know, oh, there's radioactivity in here, you can't eat in here, uh, you need to wear PPE, minimizing the time when you're in those fields, and then recognizing the distance effect. Uh, you have inverse square, meaning that the radiation attenuates as the, uh, uh, the square of the distance. So if I double the distance, the radiation field goes down by a factor of four. It's the same thing with the light, right? That the, the intensity of the light goes off as one over R squared, or gravity does that, or a Coulomb field does that. It's an inverse square dependence because it's uniformly distributed over a sphere, and that sphere area is proportional to the square of the distance of the radius. And so that's how we do a lot, how we control radiation fields. It's the, the bulk of it is, is those kinds of technologies. Here's some examples. And this is a medical facility where they've got some beta uh, uh, radioactivity that's being used for nuclear medicine and just plexiglass. That's all you need to shield the beta. 
But if you've got gamma, then we can use lead bricks or concrete or something like that because you need something with a high density and a high atomic number to really attenuate those photons, those gamma, those high energy photons. Now, when it comes to these kinds of radiation, they interact differently. And what we're always concerned with is the dose. When it comes to any kind of radiological risk, the risk is going to be in the dose. So there are other kinds of particles. You can have neutrons uh, and you can have positrons as well. And they're going to behave differently depending on the environment that they're in and the way that they interact. But what they all eventually contribute to is this, num this energy per mass. So that the dose is an energy deposited per mass. That's the dose. How much energy in a material uh, did you deposit divided by the mass of that material? And that's going to be the dose, the radiation dose that it received. And it, even though each of these will interact in a different way, it always comes back down to that same parameter. What was the energy per mass? Now we have something else that's called the dose equivalent. The dose equivalent is like a radiological effectiveness in terms of biological damage. So if you have any kind of high proliferant cell division, that's going to be more sensitive to radiation. Children are more sensitive to radiation. Highly ornate pieces of the body are more sensitive to radiation. So that the eye is going to be more sensitive than say, for example, the nose. Uh, and the gonads are going to be more sensitive than to the than the phalanges. The the more detailed that uh, uh, the biological mechanism is, the more sensitive it's going to be. And so then we convert from the energy per mass to the to the equivalent energy per mass. And then we're using REM and sievert, which uh, folds those kinds of things in. Now, when it comes to just beta and gamma, one rad will equal one REM, and one gray will equal to one sievert. But in the United States, we largely default to REM uh, simply because that's what the regulations are written in. The regulations are written in these, these uh, American units, so to speak, CGS, as opposed to SI, where the sievert uh, is the, and, and the, um, uh, the sievert is the SI unit. So the way that we measure these are with handhelds. I, I'm sure you've seen some of these in like uh, in Hollywood. Uh, different radiation detectors. These are what we use to measure radiation field. You can't see it, smell it, taste it. So you actually have to measure it. It's kind of like uh, a, an electric field. You have to have an instrument to measure it. Um, I've seen in, in Hollywood that what you see here, this, 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 this part of the, uh, this is a Geiger Mueller tube. This part right here is the active part. And I've seen people using it upside down so that they have this point, point uh, this surface pointed up. And in Hollywood, they don't know, and people that are watching it probably don't know either. So it's kind of fun to watch. You know, they got the instrument upside down, uh, but nobody knows any better because they, none of them have used it. But we also have other techniques as well, uh, such as TLDs. So uh, besides measuring just radiation fields, we also want to look for contamination. So these are air samplers. Basically, this is a pump, and you pull, you put a piece of filter paper on that nose of the pump. And then you pull a known volume of air through that pump. And after you've done that, then you'll take that filter paper off and you'll measure it with a device like this or some other kind of a device. And then when you measure the activity on the filter, you divide it by the volume of air that was pulled through it. That ratio is the concentration of the air that you ascribe to the volume that you sample. And that's how you would measure air contamination. Alternatively, if I had a surface, say for example, it was my phone and I wanted to know if there's any contamination in the phone, I could use one of these handhelds and just put it right up against my phone and see what the total amount of contamination was on the phone. Alternatively, I could take one of these smears. Basically, it's a piece of like a filter paper with a sticky back, and I can fill out some information on the back. And then I just rub it over the surface of my phone. And then I take the smear to one of these handhelds and I'll, and I'll measure the smear and see if there's any contamination, contamination on the smear. We call that removable contamination. Whereas if I just took the, the detector and put it up against the phone, I would call that total. because That's gonna be the removable plus the fixed. And so that's how we would measure both fixed contamination or airborne contamination. So that's pretty much the kind of way that we characterize an environment, the amount of contamination that you have and the radiation fields that are present. And they can both be very well, very intimately related. When it comes to personnel dosimetry, we're gonna have them wear a badge. These badges will have little crystals in them that will absorb minuscule amounts of energy when you deposit the energy into these crystals from radiation at defect sites, they're gonna be able to absorb a little bit of that and retain it. Kind of like a, a glow in the dark Frisbee will retain some energy when you shine light on it. These crystals here will retain the energy a lot longer, but it can be read out later to determine what the radiation dose is once they've been property, properly calibrated. 
and you can have a ring dosimeter or a torso dosimeter or any other kind of dosimeter that might be of interest for characterizing historical radiation fields that a person was exposed to. So when it comes to the regulations, these are what's considered the law. So these are in the, the for uh, the, any of the federal facilities or any facility that's, that's regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You can see the maximum dose that a radiation worker can get is five rem. That's, that's considered to be comparable to the OSHA limits for other industrial activities. And this assumes what we'll talk about just a little bit called the linear no threshold hypothesis, such that if you have a safe workplace, that if you're getting five rem or less, that's considered safe. Typical nuclear facilities will have nuclear workers getting on the order of about 100 millirem per year, less than background. That's not unusual uh, because it's not that difficult to control radiation fields when you're actively doing that. Uh, most facilities will have an administrative control limit that's on the range of about two or one rem. Uh, so you can sub get substantially lower than that, but that's just the law. That's the maximum that you could do. Well, let's look at this in terms of actual measurable risk. So uh, again, I, I showed you before that it was about, it was just over 600 millirem that you get from all sources combined. Now to put this in perspective in terms of the regulations, at one rem, if there was a large contamination event, the EPA would issue recommendations that everybody move away from their homes and evacuate if they could get as low as one rem per year. Now the maximum is five rem, but the point is, is that that's where they issue that recommendation at the one rem level. And so this can kind of feed into what we call radiophobia. People think if you're making me move from my home, it's gonna to have to be incredibly serious if I have to move away from my home, even though this is in the safe limit, it's just that they're being that protective. That's the idea. Remember, children are more sensitive and they don't want you getting lots of vectors, right? So if you're getting one rem from five different places, suddenly you're getting five rem. Uh, and so that's the way that they think about it, even though you recognize that this is a, a, a dose that you legally could get uh, for a radiation worker. It's a substantially lower than it. And so it's, it's difficult uh, for a lot of people in the public to be able to discriminate between what's safe and what's scary. So let's start looking at that a little bit. In terms of your daily background dose, that's about a millirem. Remember, it was about 325 millirem per year, so that's about a millirem per day. Uh, we're just going to go through orders of magnitude here until it actually gets scary. So 10 millirem, that's about what you get annually if you're a very small person just from your internal potassium. Remember, potassium is essential to live. You will die without it. The sodium potassium pump is what gets water in and out of cells. So you have to have potassium to live. And you'll get, and potassium is naturally radioactive. So you'll get about 10 millirem or a large muscular male might get 40 millirem. A small petite female might get around 10 millirem. It, it scales with muscle content, the potassium that's in there. Going up a level to 100 millirem, that's against less than background, uh, annual background, but that's about what you would get from a single x-ray to your pelvis or hip. Uh, it's also the limit for the public to a nuclear facility. That's the maximum the mem member of the public could get. Now one rem, that's the EPA evacuation dose. That's about what you would get if you were to do a stress test. I've done one of those where they look at the functioning of your heart, or if you were to get a CT scan of your hip or chest or your head. That's again, around one rem, uh, where again, the five rem is the maximum radiation worker. And at that level, at five rem, it's about two tenths of a percent. That's assuming the linear no threshold, two tenths of a percent increase in your lifetime cancer risk. It's not until you get to 10 rem that we just start to get where some studies have been able to claim that they've seen an increase in cancer risk. And there it's about half a percent. And the reason why you've got to get to that big of a dose before you see anything is because your ambient cancer risk is already between about 40 and 50% just for the average citizen. And so to be able to see a statistically significant increase is going to take a, a, a large relative uh, increase in order to see that. And that starts right at 10 rem. Uh, the, the majority of the papers don't put it out until around 20 or 30 rem. But all of this is based on the atomic bomb survivors who got doses around 100 rem, 100, 200, 300 rem, 50 rem, doses like that. And when you're up in that range, the probability increase from cancer due to dose is linear. So if you double the dose, you double the probability of getting cancer. So that at 10 rem, it, or sorry, at 100 rem, it's around 5%. So at 200 rem, it would be 10%. At 300 rem, it would be uh, 15%. 
And so they saw that with the atomic bomb survivors. And so really what all of this stuff down here is, is just extrapolating down to be conservative. So there is no measurement evidence other than, uh, well, if it's linear, it goes down there. Now, we know that that's actually not true in the sense that uh, you can get these kinds, you can get doses bigger than that just from background. And if you go to places where they do that, like Ramsar or RAN, that they get these kind of doses per year just because there's a lot of thorium in the soil, but those doses are protracted. That's averaged out over a year, whereas the atomic bomb survivors, they got it in a fraction of a second. And so there's a dose rate effectiveness factor that's just completely ignored in the linear no threshold, just to show again, how conservative we are in radiation protection regulations, which again, will feed into radiophobia. And we'll talk about that later. So it's not until you get up to around a thousand rem that pretty much no medical treatment's gonna help you. It's just like you got baked, like you were in a microwave for just too long and your body's immune system can't repair. Uh, down around hundred rem, you start to be able to repair. Uh, and it's not until you get to, in the range of about 500 rem that around half the people that get that dose will die from acute radiation syndrome. So these are the big old massive doses. This is where the threshold starts to, to be where it looks like the body is able to repair itself if you let it. If you're not uh, already, uh, if you don't have a, comorbid, uh, a comorbidity, you'll be fine. That's what it looks like. So now let's talk about radiophobia. So what the literature is showing is that if it, that for a particular worldview, that in and of itself will affect your opinion on nuclear energy. And so that might sound, I don't know if that would sound normal or strange, uh, but that would kind of like being saying, depending what, on what your religion is or your politics are, that's gonna decide on whether you like electricity or not, right? So there are people that are like that, where for some religions, they say, we don't want electricity. And what the, what the literature shows is the same applies with politics, that you can actually just have a bias on a technology simply due to your worldview. And it's also been attributed to the birth defect. Basically, nuclear technology largely exploded with the Manhattan Project. So we actually had it before the Manhattan Project, but because there were just so much money poured into the Manhattan Project, the knowledge just exploded with the atomic bomb. And so uh, it's considered a birth defect that it, that it really just exponentially increased in terms of the knowledge uh, with the development of the, uh, the nuclear weapons. So now let's talk about nuclear access. That's a really big issue when it comes to nuclear science and technology that's on people's minds. So we'll go over really quickly Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. Three Mile Island was a terror event for many people, and yet the dose was for all intents and purposes, entirely negligible. So uh, if you look at what actually people received, uh, it was on the order of the average daily background, the total event, right? And yet people were terrified for having what for all intents and purposes was increasing your daily dose for, for less than a week. And yet it cost on the order of a billion dollars, it terrified people and it uh, uh, was a big fiasco in terms of being able to communicate this risk because there were, really wasn't an infrastructure to be able to do that. It was like, who wants to talk into the telephone, to, to the television and whoever would talk, they would talk and they would give their opinion without it actually being vetted or having it backed by analysis. It was just their thought, well, this could happen. And so if this could happen, then this is my opinion. Uh, and so it caused a big issue, even though uh, it actually had a negligible effect in terms of uh, offsite dose consequences. So the big one really was Chernobyl. So with Chernobyl, that was, uh, I mean, you almost could not uh, have engineered something worse than that. So uh, the funny thing is that Chernobyl, even though it did cause a large number of deaths, there were on the order of about 30 people that died outright from acute radiation syndrome, but now that it's been so long after the, after the event that more people have died from psychological trauma than from actual radiogenic effects. So that's just crazy, right? And what it comes down to is this thing called radiophobia. I mentioned it before. Now, radiophobia, when it comes to these kinds of effects, is kind of like if somebody said to you that you have been cursed, that you now had a curse, then if you believe that, then that can cause stress. And if you have stress, that will reduce your immune system. And if it reduces your immune system, you're more likely to get sick. And if the curse told you you were going to get sick and you get sick, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
And so that's what happened to these people in Chernobyl. Literally, it, they become like a radiation person. They get a stigma and they attribute any bad thing in their life to Chernobyl. And it's just this self-reinforcing condemnation that they have no hope. And so the suicides have now increased above and beyond the radiogenic deaths, which was a, an entirely unexpected result. That was just crazy. So that the literature now shows that the psychological effects are worse than the radiogenic effects. Can you imagine that? It's just because you're so terrified that that causes more health problems than the actual, even though it was the worst case that you could imagine. You, you, you really almost couldn't make something worse than that unless you hit it with an atomic bomb. You really couldn't design it to be that much, to, to be too much worse than that. And that was, but that was the Russian design. So now let's look at what happened from Fukushima. So Fukushima was attributed to the entire death knell of the, of the Renaissance. So even though uh, nuclear looked like it was coming back, this was a Western design. This was a design that came out of the West with all of our safety criteria. How is this even possible if this managed that? So I bring down here the international uh, panel on climate change. I'm going to just assume, I'm going to make a few assumptions on uh, worldviews of our students. I'm going to assume all of our students believe the international panel on climate change. Uh, if you do uh, disagree, then we can talk about it at the end. But I'm just going to make that assumption for the purpose of this uh, presentation. And I'm going to do some other assumptions. And you can challenge me later, and that's fine. So if you believe the International Panel on Climate Change, I would ask you why. I'm assuming that you do, and you're going to say, well, the United Nations put together a panel of experts from around the world, and they looked at the evidence, and they all agreed. And then all kinds of other professional societies agreed, and all of these other climate scientists agreed even the World Health uh, Organization agreed and so forth. Um, and there's only a handful of climate scientists here and there that would disagree, right? You might say, well, as long as there's a, one or two of these climate scientists that agree with me that there is no climate change, I'm not gonna believe it. I mean, there are people that are like that. But the point that I'm making here is that what if, and this is a hypothetical, what if the United Nations put together an international panel of experts to look at the health effects from Fukushima. And then that panel then all concluded in consensus that the dose was too low to the general public to cause a single measurable medical effect from the entire release of Fukushima. So you would think that would change the entire narrative that people's attitudes would completely reverse if something like that happened. Well, truth is down in these references, that's exactly what happened the doses to the public were too low for a measurable medical effect. Remember, if it's in the range of 10 rem, you can't see it. And so the doses were even substantially lower than that, down in the range of what you already get from some places in nature. And so the World Health Organization said this, all of the professional society said this. In fact, I've never seen a credible nuclear engineer or nuclear scientist that disagreed with this. Um, what I have seen is that they say, well, Nuclear terrifies people so much that we need to just go away from it because there's too much public opposition. It's actually a good point. Uh, and then they also say the same thing applies with Yucca Mountain. The public are opposed to it because they're so terrified of it, they were not going to be able to have a place to put the waste, again, because of radiophobia. And, you know, you can't quite argue with that because it's true. Radiophobia actually causes this to not even be seen, even though this has been seen, this has been done, and they've even done multiple studies after this and reinforced it no measurable medical effects from the entire Fukushima release. All of it was too low for the general public. And that's just in Japan. That doesn't count for people over here or people anywhere. That's just for the people in Japan. It was below measurable uh, uh, levels. Another example is nuclear waste. I kind of mentioned that, that that's what the, some of the ex experts will point out is that people are terrified of it. In fact, uh, it's, been, it's been shown uh, in the literature that it's almost like a terror phrase, that if you say nuclear waste, people are thinking that these are, there are these horrific accidents that are just gonna kill everybody and yet nothing's ever happened. There has been no technical analysis that's been done, even though it's used in the literature as a, a proof of why nuclear energy is bad. Even though there is no quantitative risk analysis that's associated with it, it's just used as like a proof, kind of like uh, uh, a, a default. It's this ethos that, that's, built, that's built into this systematic belief that just the word is proof alone, and that's it. Now, the literature says that this is actually a form of tribalism. Tribalism is something apparently that's very natural to us. It came from being uh, coming out of a, a hunter-gatherer 
uh, evolution such that uh, you will automatically, or you are automatic, you, you naturally will be biased to think that whatever your tribe is, wherever you were born, that your tribe is good and that the other tribe is evil. And then when your tribe does something bad, it's in spite of the fact that you're good. And when the other tribe does something good, it's in spite of the fact that they're bad. And that was a survival mechanism to help each tribe support itself and keep itself uh, sustained. So you can see what's wrong with it, right? Every tribe is doing that, right? It's this, uh, and it doesn't just apply uh, to, uh, to technology. Uh, there's this natural bias to think that, you know, uh, the, the, the school that you live by is the best school or the, the soda or the car manufacturer or whatever. Uh, you, you have this tribalism where, you where, where the narrative is collective and that you have to adopt that, that narrative if you're gonna be a part of that tribe. So that's literally become part of the ethnography of our nation. That's what the, 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 this literature down here shows, which means that it's assumed to be true without proof. So when it comes to nuclear waste, how bad is the problem? So if you think about this, since the 1970s, around 20% of all of our electricity has come from nuclear. That's a lot. Since the 1970s, 20% of all of our electricity from nuclear and it would not fill a single football field above 10 yards, three meters high. If you put these things on their side and roll them into a football field, all that's out there would not even fill a single, fill a single football field. And that's just because of the energy density. The energy density of nuclear, the, the amount of energy that you get per reaction is you know, hundreds of millions of times, about 200 million uh, electron volts per fission. Whereas with chemistry, you might get say one electron volt per atom in a chemical reaction. So it's just a huge energy density difference when you're making heat with nuclear as opposed to burning fossil fuels. So it's really not as bad as people think, especially since there haven't been any accidents with this material and it's easy to control and handle and it's a very small amount. So the smaller it is, the easier and more cost effective it can be. So I'm going to do a little bit of a rabbit's trail, a very cool rabbit's trail. And I'm going to talk about this place in Africa, Gabon. There's a, a uranium mine there. And in that uranium mine, they found that all of the natural isotopes had some perturbations to them. Very strange perturbations because it started with recognizing that the fissile component of the uranium, uranium-235, was less than it was anywhere else on Earth as far as we've ever measured. And they found out the reason why is because that fissile, uranium-235, it's got a shorter half-life than the fissionable uranium-238, which means if you go backwards in time a few billion years, the uranium-235, which is decaying faster forward, it enriches faster going backwards. So back a few billion years after the formation of the Earth, the uranium that was naturally in the Earth would have been around the same enrichment that we have in commercial nuclear reactors now. And what that means then is that if you had geology that concentrated it in a geological formation, and you got some water in there, it would go critical. And that's what happened here. And so if you look at the natural neodymium that we get elsewhere where there isn't any uranium, and you look at what you have for the oak low, it turns out in oak low, it's a linear superposition of the natural neodymium isotopic distribution and that from fission, the fission, the, the, the decay chain isotopes from uranium-235 fission. So that the uh, neodymium addition to the oak low mix that's required to get what's measured is a fission distribution, which shows that these, the, the, the uranium actually did fission. And what's significant about it is that the nuclear waste stayed in the ground, it didn't move. So this is a, a, an empirical demonstration that you can dis dispose of nuclear waste in a geological formation and let it sit there until it just becomes dirt, just a different kind of dirt. Oh, and I already talked about this, okay, all right. So Yucca Mountain uh, literature also shows that it's become tribalistic, that you just need to mention the word and it's all arms go up and say, yeah, that's proof you shouldn't do nuclear. It's like, it's, it's an assumed truth with no proof. So it's an ethnography. It's part of the narrative of the tribe, <clears throat> which is similar to politics and religion. That's considered also a natural predisposition that we as humans will naturally default to some kind of a collective tribal narrative. So here is actually an example of a geological uh, repository where there actually was a release. This is again, a worst case scenario, a drum deflagrated and it basically dumped all of its stuff into the, uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the repository and the repository safety features leaked. Funny thing is, is that 
even though this terrified people, people were thinking of moving, literally, because this was the plume. This was a verified, validated plume. And you can see these little purple flags. That's where we actually measured it. And we were able to demonstrate, yep, that's what it was. The model was normalized to the measurements and, and, and they agreed quite well, giving us confidence that we did understand it and that we did correctly characterize it. The, even though we were able to measure this, turns out that the actual plume here was on the order of, it was comparable to the actual atmospheric weapons fallout from the prior century. So let me say that again. We have atmospheric weapons fallout all around the earth because in the past century, the nuclear weapons uh, countries had been doing atmospheric weapons tests uh, out in the Pacific or out in uh, other places around the globe. And so the fallout's all around the world, including americium, which is what this was. So the actual americium that was deposited out here in public land, it just around doubled what was there pre doubled prior doubled what was there prior to the uh, building of that facility. So it was in a rather literal sense trivial because you can uh, you can naturally get concentrations of this stuff, the fallout, based on its solubility and how it transports with water. And so even though it was a trivial release, it really was a big deal in the sense that it was not planned and it was not controlled. And when that happens, that means that if you don't do anything bad, pretty much just getting lucky because you weren't controlling it and it wasn't planned. So how do you know it couldn't have been worse? In a sense, it was, it was kind of like Chernobyl. It was about the worst that you could possibly get. It was like, uh, uh, it was like having a dirty bomb. It, I, I would say it was having a dirty bomb go off in your repository. So it, pretty hard to imagine something worse than that. But the point is, is that the safety features work like they did at Fukushima, which is why the actual release was trivial because it was designed for this worst case. That's how we do it in nuclear. We just assume the worst thing is gonna happen. And we say, all right, if the worst thing happens, let's design this so that people at the fence are gonna be safe. And uh, even though that worked and, that, and, and it was supposed to be that way, it doesn't mean people weren't terrified. And they were, they were terrified. Because remember, the EPA will issue evacuation guidelines, tell you to leave your house if you're gonna get a dose every year comparable to getting you know, a chest X-ray. And so, uh, you know, that might not make a lot of sense that we're just, that, that, that's the way that our, that, that our regulations are. They're just that conservative uh, to, 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 to uh, protect the, the, the weakest in the society. Because if you're getting, again, 10 RAM is around where we're just able to see measurable effects in children. You don't, we don't see those in adults, but in children, for, radio, uh, for children that have gone through radiotherapy, that's right around the threshold. So if you're getting one REM from the earth, right, you could be getting, you know, another nine REM for somewhere else, uh, even though that doesn't take the dose rate effectiveness factor into consideration. But that's just how conservative those things are. So now let's talk about some real engineering. So let's not look at the radiological risk, but the engineering uh, risk management issues. And so this came from the Department of Energy, and it comes down to how much material is required to generate a gigawatt, or in this case, a terawatt because with nuclear, it has a huge energy density. So the amount of material that's required to do that, remember all that material, most of it's being manufactured, the concrete and the steel, most of that's being manufactured with energy from fossil fuels, from coal and natural gas. And so you don't wanna have a lot of that. You wanna get a lot of energy with, a little, with only having to generate a little bit of greenhouse gases. And when you make the actual installations, that's gonna require materials, which requires energy. And you can see when it comes to what are considered the traditional renewables, nuclear has the lowest. And because it just has so much energy over such a long period of time, it doesn't need to be replaced as often as say uh, solar panels or something like that. For the, and, and solar panels, they have a much lower energy density. They don't give you as much energy uh, for materials that you have. And so nuclear is the lowest. So it, it, from that perspective, it's entirely uh, green relative to this metric. Another metric is greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not just how much materials are required to generate a gigawatt, but how much greenhouse gas is emitted per gigawatt. And when you look at the traditional renewables over here, you can see nuclear is as good or better than some of them. And it's as good as most of them in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because it doesn't release greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, like the rest, right? Uh, if you have wind, you've got to drive a truck in there to get a person to go up and do maintenance and that truck releases some greenhouse gases and you have trucks at a nuclear power plant or anywhere else. Um, and so that's why these are so low. They're not zero because there are other facilities or other infrastructure that does still use greenhouse gas, mainly as gasoline, stuff like that. 
but you can see that it's extremely low compared to any of the others. So even the International Panel on Climate Change, when they issued their recommendation saying we need to control climate change, they actually called out nuclear. They actually said, you need to do nuclear. You're gonna have a real hard time making these goals if you wipe out nuclear, which a lot of countries have done. They said, well, we're gonna do it without nuclear. We're so smart, we're so great. We're gonna do it without nuclear and God bless them. I hope they do it. But uh, operationally and effectively, uh, it's gonna be very difficult because of the such, such the massive amount of electricity that you can generate base load and it doesn't release greenhouse gases. So another thing that I would think should, be, should resonate with people is, is what is the death rate? What is the actual death rate? And if you go to the non-developed uh, countries versus the developed countries, if you're looking at, the, and these have been uh, 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 tabulated by the OECD, nuclear looks incredibly impressive in terms of the number of people that die per gigawatt electric year that's generated. Now, the numbers over here are for Ukraine, which is not an OECD country, and these were only from the outright deaths. The actual number of cancers afterwards are in the thousands. <clears throat> Um, uh, but those are the people that died from the acute radiation syndrome. And you can see that in the US, hydro is really good, right? Unless you're falling off the dam, uh, things are pretty safe. Although in the non-OECD countries, you know, uh, sometimes they use an earthen dam and if that breaks, you're gonna kill a lot of people. But the, the point with this is that in principle, you would think it's, it should be just as bad to die from you know, natural gas as from coal, as from hydro or from nuclear. That, a death from nuclear isn't any worse or any better than a death from anything else. Uh, but that's, what the, that's where that uh, ethnography comes in. The ethnography says that a death from cancer from nuclear is worse than a death from a trip or fall uh, if it's from, say, solar or, or wind. And here's an example of that. So uh, these are the safety rates that you get from various industries, from construction, transportation. You can see agriculture, that's the worst, right? Farm accidents. And so these are the, the, the number of fatalities and work injuries that you get from a standard assortment of industries that we have. Now, in order to make a comparison for nuclear, I made, I, I pulled up this paper of the, uh, the fatality rate at a wind farm in Greece. So it's a small one, it's only 14 megawatts, but every now and again, a person will fall from one of the, the, the turbines or something like that will happen and then they will die. So that, would, that, so that gave uh, three times 10 to the minus three deaths per gigawatt. Now that sounds really good and it could be a lot worse. I mean, still any one death is unacceptable, but the point is that's a really low number. So if that's what it is per gigawatt, if you compare that to nuclear, which generates uh, substantially more, many, many, uh, many, many gigawatts instead of 14 uh, uh, megawatts, we generate uh, many tens of gigawatts. If you scale that up, that would have been at this death rate for the nuclear in 2018, that would have required 2,500 deaths and we had zero. And so again, this comes back to the ethnography. Well, dying from wind is okay, but dying from nuclear is not. Dying from nuclear is bad. That's where that ethnography comes in, where you don't have to have a rationalization. It's just an accepted truth without a challenge. And so this is just a, a good example of that. So now as I come to the end, I'm at the end of my 45 minutes. So I'm gonna make another assumption. I'm just gonna assume for the sake of discussion here, that you agree that uh, modern medicine should be considered a human right. But now I'm gonna put on my engineer hat. So I've been wearing my health physics hat. Now I'm gonna wear my, 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 uh, my engineer hat. I'm gonna point something out here. So as good as that statement is, it's worth recognizing that without technology, you don't have medicine, right? Without, uh, uh, if a person doesn't have clothing, they're probably not gonna care about medicine. If they don't have housing, I don't know how much they're gonna worry about medicine. If they don't have clean water, if they don't have uh, heating in the winter or cooling in the summer, maybe medicine isn't quite so important. Um, but if they don't have transportation, they can't even get there. And so all of these things that I just mentioned, right? To be able to have clean water, to be able to have food, to be able to have heating, clothing, housing, all of that requires electricity. And so, electricity fundamentally is really what supports our society in terms of maintaining these systems of systems that give us not just our standard of living, but our ability to live. And electricity is not even considered a human right. But if it is, then where is it gonna come from? Because all of this is predicated on the idea, just think about Texas right now, on having electricity. 
And as long as we allow uh, a narrative that is strictly not based on science or is strictly not based on any kind of objective analysis other than this is what I want to believe and so I don't need to prove it, uh, we're gonna have those difficulties that the anti-nuclear nuclear engineers point out and that's that the public just doesn't want it. The public does not want nuclear, they're afraid of it, they think it's evil, they think it's bad, they think that nuclear waste is a terror phrase and that leaves us at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, we have three questions uh, ready to go. So I'll go ahead and ask. One's from an anonymous attendee, um, but their question is, what were some of the uses of nuclear energy before the Manhattan Project? Oh, that's I a fun question. There's a little bit here question. and there. Great question. All right. So um, before the Manhattan Project, it was discovered, uh, there was a really famous uh, project that was done that uh, the word cancer actually comes from uh, uh, one of the, uh, I don't remember if it was Greek or Latin. I, I think it might've been Greek, might've been Latin, but it comes from the word that means crab. And that's the way the cancer looked at, it appeared on the surface of the body. And the, uh, when radium was first discovered, uh, there was a physician that actually decided to try this on a cancer. A person had this massive tumor on their face and he started applying radium exposure for a long period of time and the cancer went away. And so in, in a day and age when, I mean, think of this was uh, over hundred years ago, uh, almost 120 years ago, uh, the ability to what looked like and actually was curing cancer. We still do it today with radiotherapy. Uh, and so with that, people started verifying that you actually could do that. that. But what that led to, remember the level of technology that they had back then, it was like a miracle drug so that people would be drinking radium salts. Uh, the, it wasn't until we had the radium dial painters that we realized that, that this stuff could kill. Uh, and that was that they would take radium and they would put it in paint and they would paint the dials on watches uh, where the paint was glow in the dark paint, but it had radium in it. And so the, the, the dial would always show, it would always light up like an exit sign. Uh, we used to use uh, tritium in exit signs to keep it lit when you had no power. And so because they kept doing that, they would wick the, they would wick the, uh, uh, the, uh, the paintbrushes in their mouth. And then that way they would have a very fine tip and that way they would paint the dials on there. Well, after about 20 years of doing that, they all got these horrific mouth cancers. And so it was like, well, how can this radium, which cures cancer, cause cancer? Uh, well, that's because not only does it kill the, 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 uh, the cancer, but it can also cause damage to the tissue if it's in a very large dose. And so uh, the applications before that were this idea that it was a miracle drug, right? It was this miracle of science that uh, was very highly attenuated once they realized that at large doses, this can kill. In fact, many think that that's how Mata, uh, Marie Curie died um, was because of this lack of knowledge of the effects at high dose that, uh, that they can accumulate if there are these acute doses. So there were a number of things that were like that uh, before the Manhattan Project. And for the most part though, it was a research topic and people were still trying to figure it out um, but that was probably the biggest one was it was very early recognized that this could be used for medicine. Uh, Lord Rankin, what we actually named the Rankin for, recognized that you could see through a hand, right? If you could see a broken bone, you know, uh, that can do a lot. Hope that answers the question. Didn't they also make the, used to make old glassware out of uranium? Uh, so they, they, they did for a long time, uh, and, and even after the Manhattan Project, but that was uh, with uranium compounds because it gave very fancy colors. But what ended up happening is that oh, 20 years, 30 years ago, people, just like lantern mantles, uh, uh, people would use those to do demonstrations for the public, like put a Geiger counter up to it and make the thing scream, and that would terrify people even though they were trying to say, look, it's harmless. This is not a big deal. This is natural stuff. And I just put some dirt and I put it in some, and, and, I, and I centered it and I made it a glaze. Um, but now it makes the Geiger counter, you know, 10 times higher than it is when it's away from the plate. And yeah, it's 10 times higher background right there. 
But at background, again, you can go over large variations about an order of magnitude of background with no measurable effect, actually a little bit more than that. Um, but without communicating that, it just terrified people. So they actually banned the use of that, oh, I don't know, about 10 or 15 years ago, using uranium glazes to make uh, uh, fiesta ware, that's what it was called. And the same with lantern mantles. Those used to have thorium and thorium oxide to help it from not burning. So they found other compounds, again, uh, simply because of the fear of naturally occurring radioactive materials. Wow. Um, we have another question from uh, Mr. Braden Goodwin. Uh, they want to know when were these workplace rim millirim regulations and limits put into place in the U.S. and were the specific values that we use today still derived from events such as the atomic bombings uh, or or any uh, accidents? So we actually did have regulations uh, all the way back till uh, even a few years before the Manhattan Project, so that they actually had limits that they used. Um, but the limits back then were substantially higher. Uh, if you look, if you remember back to that risk table, they actually reflected those risk tables so that they said, unless you get a measurable effect, we're not going to worry about it so much. And so it wasn't until substantially after that, right around in the 70s, where the limits we have, where we're saying, we're not going to let people even be exposed anywhere near a measurable effect. We're going to cut it by at least an order of magnitude, and sometimes even more, a few orders of magnitude. So it's got to be even less than background, for example. And so that came that started around in the 70s, where that level of conservatism was built into our radiation protection regulations, uh, which even though it's ultra conservative, people tend to interpret if it's a regulation, then that's the only thing that's safe. And if, it, if that's safe, I want to be even safer than that, uh, even though that's already built into the regulation, uh, that you're substantially below a measurable effect, which uh, In the case, for example, even with Fukushima, like it was with Chernobyl, the psychosomatic effects uh, turned out to be the deadliest. And it, so it, I, I, I had it in the slide, I didn't point it out. The only deaths from Fukushima were from the panic evacuation. And it was in the slide that I had, and there was a reference there. Um, but the point is, is that people literally risked their lives and lost them to avoid something that wasn't even measurable. And that's kind of, that, the, that's why there's this emphasis on recognizing the effect of radiophobia, uh, like a curse, right? If you believe it, it can become, it can affect you if you believe it, even if it's just words. Um, AJ Benny wants to know, how is the Q value determined in that dose equivalent formula? Ah, so, so that comes from uh, uh, historical studies on things like animals, so that you recognize that uh, if cells are, 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 are replicating, if you have stem cells and you irradiate them, uh, then they're more likely to have a, a measurable effect. So uh, it, when, they're, when the cells are proliferating, for example, uh, in the first trimester, if you have a fetus that will get a dose, say around 100 rem, it's a huge dose, it is likely going to cause uh, uh, deformation. Uh, uh, abnormalities. There's a, it, it's kind of like fetal alcohol syndrome, right? If the female is uh, an alcoholic in the first trimester, it can cause birth defects. And those large doses will also cause birth defects. They're not genetic. So the, the gene isn't changed, but the development of the, uh, of the fetus is stumped uh, because the cells are proliferating. And so in order again, uh, to mitigate that, there were, when I looked at, when I had that, um, the, the regulations table, it actually had a layer, a, 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 an entry there for a pregnant radiation worker. And that's even lower than a regular radiation worker. And that's many orders of magnitude below uh, what would actually cause a measurable effect. And again, it's just for this level of conservative, conservatism that's built into the regulations. Hope that answered it. Um, we have two questions from uh, Zachary Miller. Uh, the first, do you think fusion, if possible, would be safer from a health physics perspective than fission? No. Um, so fusion actually also causes radioactivity. Uh, it would be like, I mean, the, the analogy is like, is, is making aluminum safer than making nickel? Uh, if you make it safer, then it's safer. If you don't make it safer, then it's not safer. So it just comes down to how you do the design. Uh, so 
I like to quote oh, Forrest Gump, safety is as safety does. Uh, it, it, it's up to you to, to implement the level of safety that you think it warrants. That would be my opinion. And the second question is, could you explain the salty disc joke before the presentation for a non-nuke major? Oh, yes. So the, the point is, is that they're not going to know if it's salty unless they touch their tongue to it. And if you're tasting it, that means that you're ingesting some of it. And if you're ingesting some of it, that means you're knowingly eating anthropogenic radioactive material. It's like, why would you do that? You're ruining the source on top of it, right? You're not putting thumbprints on it. You're putting tongue, tongue prints on it. And uh, it's just a bad practice to think you can go around doing that because you don't even know how much radioactivity you're taking in, right? It's kind of like the radium dial painters. We know if you get a lot of it, it's going to cause a problem. How do you know you didn't get a lot of it? Did you even take a measurement? Did you measure before and after? Did you know what went into it? Apparently, you didn't even care or you wouldn't be tasting it in the first place. Um, and then I think we have time for one last question. Um, an anonymous attendee wants to know what is the best valid argument against nuclear energy from a health perspective? It's the radiophobia. So it comes down to uh, if I if I told you that you're cursed and you believed it, then you're going to stress and your stress is going to reduce your immune system and your reduced immune system is going to make you more likely to have a health effect. If you have a health effect, you're going to attribute it to the curse. And so you're going to think, oh, I'm cursed. Right? So that's why the number of deaths from Chernobyl have been the dominant number of deaths are from suicide, from people that feel they're cursed. Everything is, is just going wrong. And so the same has actually occurred with Fukushima. Uh, it wasn't so the, the health effects, the main health effects are the, the deaths from the evacuation. But the follow on health effects are again from radiophobia. It's hypertension, uh, it's stress related uh, uh, heart disease, and uh, uh, diabetes from overeating. So the what they found is that, I mean, unless you're going to say, well, even if you're afraid, radiation is going to cause you to overeat because you're stressed. That's really not what the professionals say. That doesn't make sense. What does make sense is that you think you're cursed. If you think you're cursed, then that causes you to stress. And that stress is a measurable, it does give a measurable health effect. It, it reduces your immune system. So opportunistic diseases are easier to get a foothold and take you down. Uh, and I believe that's all the questions. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, those are great thorough answers too. Uh, I learned a lot. So thanks for asking the questions for me too. So I learned something too. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a brief outro from our president. So I'll hand it over. Yeah, to uh, thanks Hayden for moderating the Q&A. That was very interesting. Um, but yeah, I wanna say that's all the time we have for this webinar. Again, I wanna thank Dr. Hayes for presenting this fascinating talk, as well as thanking you all for joining us in our second event for this semester. Uh, again, if you wanna learn more about our organization and upcoming events, please visit our website at ncsuenergyclub.org. Uh, but we're also in, on Instagram at student energy club. So. That is all we have for this webinar. Thank you all for coming and have a great week.